Good morning, everybody. On behalf of Vic Notil, welcome to our webinar this morning on compost. Uh, this is being made possible by funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program and the Wimmera CMA. So I'd like to introduce David Hardwick and Hi, Tara Heinsen. So over to you, David. Thanks, Penny. G'day everyone. Sorry we're a little bit late. We thought everyone else wasn't checking in, but we just didn't hit a button. So that's our mistake. Thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome to the little webinar, Compost, Making and Using It on Farm. Uh, I'm David Hardwick. If you don't know me, I've done a few webinars uh, for uh, Big No Till and uh, they've asked me to put together this one for compost and I've got Tara Heinsen with me helping out. Um, g'day Tara, thanks for coming along. Hi, Ron, and yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great. Tara's making compost on the farm in Western Vic, so she'll be able to share her experience through the webinar. So I'm just going to share the screen. So if you just bear with me a minute, we'll get the screen up and we'll uh, start the webinar off. So hopefully everyone can see that screen. Tara, I better get you just to check if you can see it. It's um, all good. Yep, all right. So we're going to jump in today and explore making compost and or using it on farm. And some people might not want to make it, but they want to use it. And other people might be really keen, like Tara and her family, and make it as well as use it. Uh, and what we're trying to do when we make compost is pretty much transform uh, material like that stuff on the left uh, to something like that on the right. And so it's all about making the black gold uh, that we call compost. So what we're going to do in this webinar, which is going to go for about 60 to 75 minutes, is we're going to explore the following topics. We're going to look at compost, what it is and the different types of compost and why you would bother using it. Then we're going to look at the three ways to skin the compost cat. And if you love cats, well, I won't ask you to think about your cat being thrown into the compost. But we're going to look at fermentative, aerated and vermi compost or worm composting. So there's actually three ways to do composting and we're going to just have a brief look at the three methods. Then what you need to get ready to make compost if you're going to do it on farm, uh, the feedstock or the materials, the equipment and your site, considerations for where to do it and how to set up your site. Uh, then we're going to look at the process of making a batch of compost just briefly. So how you control what we call the decomposition process. Uh, then, then the next thing is we're going to look at if you want to add things to your compost, what we call customising your compost, like minerals or clay, and looking at the quality of compost as the second last thing today. What are you looking for when you're either buying compost or if you're making it yourself, what should you be looking for? And finally, the pros and cons of how to use compost in different ways. So that's really what we'll be sort of covering at the end there. And the picture there is of a mate of mine, Jerry Gillespie, who pretty much invented the sort of modern fermentation method that a number of people are using around Australia. So he's not going to eat that compost, by the way. He's just having a look at it. All right, so let's jump in. If you do have any questions on today's webinar, if something pops up, well, we've got the chat going. So just punch your question into chat and we will... Uh, to address it towards the end, um, but I will just get my chat going if you just bear with me a minute uh, so I can see any chats. And if we have a burning question that we can sort of pause and between me and Tara, we can answer, then we'll do that during the session. Uh, it's, it's only a one hour to 75 minute webinar, so we can't go into super detail on everything. So um, there will be some opportunities to follow up in different ways after the webinar. Okay, so let's look at compost, what it is and why you bother using it. So the key thing about compost is it's a product made from the controlled decomposition of organic materials. So the key words there are controlled decomposition. It's like not you just chuck stuff on a paddock and let it randomly decompose. You sort of control that process. And it's all different organic materials. So it can be green waste, food waste, paper, hay. It's also animal carcasses, manures, biosolids. Anything that comes from a living thing originally can be put through compost and made into compost. The raw materials that you use are called feedstocks or compost feedstocks. And basically to make compost, uh, pretty much in a nutshell, you mix it all together, you add water, 
you put it in a windrow and here's a windrow in northern New South Wales on a job from a few years ago now where there's hay and sheep manure and it's called a, a heap if it's just a pile or it's a long one you call it a windrow and sometimes you'll add other stuff in as well so you just make your windrow chuck in what you need to or you want to uh, and then you go from there so that windrow then starts to decompose or break down and here's Tara's operation out um, in Western Vic and you can see here they've got the windrows going and what happens in those windrows is that a whole bunch of microbes actually that are naturally there they start to decompose or eat all that material because they're chasing energy water and nutrients just like us and just like cows and sheep and everything else and so they start to decompose it to get their nutrition basically and your job if you, if you are making compost your job is pretty much to manage the decomposition process um, and so you're making sure that it happens in a controlled manner and that's really important that if you lose a bit of control over the, the process things can go pear-shaped uh, and this is a, a, an on-farm compost operation again in New South Wales this one um, but actually, even if you're doing compost and you think you're really good at it, it's the microbes that actually do all the work for you. Um, if you get things right and look after them, they're the ones that are transforming that material into a high quality compost for you. So it's actually you're working with the microbes, particularly bacteria. Um, and a well-made, so why would you use compost? Well, a well-made compost is a really good soil conditioner and it can be really useful to help you improve soil health. So it's, it's a really good uh, soil ameliorant um, when, it's, when it's used in the right way for the right agronomic reasons. So it's a really good tool. Um, and if you think about your soil, it's an asset in your business. It's one of the most important assets in your farm's business. It's one of the capital assets of your business, like your machinery and your buildings. Uh, and we call that the natural capital. And so obviously it's an asset, you need to keep it in good condition. So if you don't keep your soil in good condition, you're not gonna have optimal yields, optimal profit for your enterprise. And if your soil gets in poor condition, then you're gonna have to buy a bulldozer and ship in some new soil, dig out the old soil and ship it in. No, I'm just kidding. It's just a picture of someone digging a hole. Okay, so um, here's Tara's operation and Tara's getting pretty serious there by the look, Tara, it's starting to haul some compost out to the paddock, correct? So you're using it obviously to fix a couple of soil issues or try and improve your soil health and try and get better yields. Would that be a fair summary of what you're aiming for? Yeah, for sure. Just improve our soil structure. Yeah. Um, microbes out there. And yeah. Just yeah. Yep. It's yeah, it's a bit of an all-rounder compost when it's used, you know, a good quality. It's got microbes. It also helps with structure and organic matter. So we'll come back and maybe explore a little bit more, you know, the specific agronomic benefits of it. Um, but it not only can it help you with soil health, but you can use it as a fertiliser, especially when it's used at higher rates. Uh, it actually has some nutrients in it. It doesn't have a high analysis of nutrients, but um, at high rates, it's, it's supplying a fair bit of nutrition to your paddock. Um, and here's a, here's a cabbage operation or farm in Queensland that pretty much grows on compost. 90% of the inputs to that are compost. So, and not only does it add nutrients, but it also really helps the efficiency of any fertilizers you add. So if you're using compost as part of a holistic sort of regenerative agronomy program, it will help you get efficiency in say your nitrogen or your phosphorus fertilizer use. So um, it's a good all rounder in many ways. But some of the specific things that it does is it adds organic matter to the soil. Uh, it improves soil structure, um, which is what Tara mentioned she's chasing, which in turn helps with water holding capacity. Um, it helps the biological health of my soil by adding you know, a whole community of microbes. Uh, it adds nutrients and it helps, it can help to minimize plant pests and diseases. And that, that's been really clearly shown in, in horticulture where high quality compost can minimize soil borne diseases. Um, oh, Matt's just saying it's a little hard to hear you, Tara, so you're gonna to have to speak up when you speak. Um, so there's three ways to skin the compost cat. 
uh, and we'll go through them now and you might get Tara to just tell us her, her method she uses, but there's three ways to do it. Um, and people do get a bit sort of uh, particular about their compost, which is fair enough, because it's a pretty exciting thing to do if you're getting into it. But um, there is three different ways and they all do work when they're done right. So sometimes people are very adamant that this is the only way to do it, but you will see good compost made on all three approaches. Um, and no matter which way you decide to tackle the compost approach, um, the key is to control the decomposition of the raw material. You've got to be in charge and not, don't let it get feral um, by utilising the beneficial microbes that are in the material. And uh, the key, the key, uh, the keys to success are balanced feedstock materials, um, the correct temperature control, the right microbial community, correct moisture levels, and the right level of oxygen. And so we'll, we'll briefly touch on all of them. And you can see the picture there. There's five different grades of compost, all made at different composting sites. And you can even see the little, uh, the one in the top left is is actually prilled compost. So compost that's been made into a prill. Um, so three ways to skin the cat. The most common composting method is to continually add air to the compost heap. So this is usually done with something called a compost turner, where you mix the compost material on a regular basis with a turner. But you can also use a tractor or a front end loader. I'm just going to stop the webinar for a sec because Gordon has said the audio has gone. So, uh, Tara, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Um, so, Gordon, I'm not sure if it's you or everyone else. If anyone else is having audio problems, like they can't hear anything, please put it into chat so hopefully we can sort it out. But I'll keep going. Um, so, the aer this method, which we call aerated or turned compost, Thanks, Marinda. Righto, Chris. Looks like it's just a Gordon Williams issue, Gordon. So the, the air encourages the compost microbes and helps to control that process. And this method is called the aerated or turned compost method. Uh, another important way that you can make aerated compost is as long as you keep airflow continuing into the material, you can make aerated compost without turning it and it's usually done with pipes. So you can see here, this is a static pile aerated compost. So this one here is uh, called a Johnson Sioux reactor. So I'm pretty sure some of you would have watched a YouTube video or heard about the Johnson Sioux reactor. So this is one we've just made west of Aubrey and it's an aerated compost. It's just, we don't need to turn it um, because of the uh, pipes in it. So I've got some pickies of Tara's uh, operation in a minute, but I'll just show quickly the other two methods and then we might be able to have a look at that. Um, so another way to make compost is to mix the materials and then inoculate the compost with special fermenting microbes. So this picture here is, a, is, a, is of a batch of fermenting compost microbes that are, has been made on the site, ready to be applied to the compost windrow. Uh, and in this method, the microbes are mixed into the windrow um, and they decompose the material under conditions of low oxygen. So it's not the same as a silage operation. There is a little bit of oxygen, but it's a low, it's a, what we call a ferment. So it's not turned much. You can turn it, but you can also uh, not turn it at all in some cases. So here's some windrows of fermentation compost uh, and uh, the key thing here is that the oxygen levels kept low and we call this fermentation composting. Here's a site in North Central Victoria where it's done really well. And it's sometimes called spice, min turn, no turn and surprise, surprise, also static pile compost. It's different than aerated static pile, obviously, but if you get it right and you don't need to turn at all, then you can call it static pile, I guess. Um, the third way, just to quickly summarise the three ways that compost is made is with earthworms. So earthworms are fed the compost materials like food scraps, cardboard and manure, etc. And then the worms, and, and importantly, the millions of 
billions of bacteria that live with them then decompose the materials. So even though you might think, oh, a worm compost is mainly the worms doing it, it's true the worms are really important, but it's the bacteria that live with them that do a lot of the hard lifting in composting. So this type of composting is called vermicomposting. Um, the final product is called vermicompost. Gee, that's, that's unusual. And it's sometimes you call them vermicasts. And this is a site in uh, Ballarat where uh, vermicomposting is done on quite a large scale just out of Ballarat. So no matter which way you do compost, um, people often leave compost piles to mature or age before selling. And this can further enhance the quality of the product. So at this site here, they leave the compost for a month or two just to let it mature and let some more fungal activity evolve in it and before they sell it, although they get a lot of demand for it, so it's hard sometimes for them to let it sit, sit there. And whichever way, if you are thinking to make compost on farm, I guess whichever way you decide to do it, it's really important to try and keep your labour costs down, your water use to a minimum, and your machinery costs down, just so that the economics of it stack up for you. So let's get into a bit of practicality and we'll be able to get Tara to give her her experience now in how they're doing it on their site. Uh, there's sort of three things you need to do when you're getting ready. Uh, hang on, I've got someone raising their hand here, so bear with me. Tim, I'm just gonna have to keep going because I can't get, get the thing open, but if you can put something in the chat, that'll be good. Um, so the three things you have to get ready for compost making on farm is uh, the site, your compost feedstock and equipment. So uh, Tara, do you want to tell us about your site and why you picked that site and, and sort of why it was chosen and, and what are the considerations? Yep, sure. Um, hopefully you can hear me a bit better now. Um, so we do the aerated windrow compost um, with a turner. So we, um, our feedstock comes from my brother's piggery that's on the farm and the straw comes from the farm, goes into the piggery and then comes back out as um, manure and straw to make the compost. So our, or our site was made to be close to where the manure was coming from, just the efficiency. So that's the main reason why we we'll put put the site. Um, and then, yeah, the feedstock come from the piggery, which is a straw on the manure. And um, if there's any old straw on the farm, we put that in any top bales, like hay top bales that are not used for stock or go into the compost. Um, and then, yeah, use the turner. Yeah. So, you, so you're a long way from neighbours there and you're sort of away from the road a bit. So it's quite a quiet sort of spot to do it because sometimes neighbours do get a bit antsy. Uh, yeah. What about drainage and, and traffic, traffic at a bit, whatever the word is, trafficability, um, you know, in the wet year, like how do you find that getting around the piles? And Yeah, it's, um, it is a bit more of a summer, summer pad, it does get quite wet. So hmm. um, well, as, as time goes on, we're kind of making a harder base um, yeah. with where the roads are. Yeah. So there is a point in the winter where we just, leave the rows and um, come back when it dries out a bit. So that is a bit of a problem, but we just, yeah, to, it'd be pretty expensive to make the whole pad um, traffic. Yeah, yep. hard stand, yeah. So there's a bit to thinking where to locate your site and it's important to think that through before you jump in because you might have to shift everything in a year or two. Great, thanks for that, Tara. And you, you just mentioned sort of the materials that you use. So this second key consideration, if you're going to make compost on farm, is getting the compost feedstock. So you mentioned, Tara, that you've got pig manure coming out of a piggery that your brother's running, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's what we call a high nitrogen material. And the other thing that you'll need to make compost uh, is high carbon. So this picture here is of a site, again, that same windrow you saw at the beginning of the webinar and that's me uh, us mixing uh, sheet manure with hay so we're trying to get a relatively high nitrogen uh, material the sheet manure and mix it with some carbon 
and that can be hay, straw, wood chips, etc. So your food waste, your manure and your carcasses and even very green plant material can be quite high in nitrogen. Everything else is usually quite high in carbon. Uh, and the jargon that we use in, in the composting game is that you want a balance of sort of materials and you're aiming between what's called a carbon to nitrogen ratio, which is kind of like measuring the digestibility of the material. So if, you ever, if you're in the livestock game and you're feeding sheep or cows, you'll know that it's all about digestibility of feed, the quality of the feed for the animal, not just the quantity. And so it's the same in composting. You need to have a reasonable balance of protein to energy, uh, sort of, so to speak, uh, to, for the microbes to get active and do their job. And that's the ratio of carbon to nitrogen that we kind of usually aim for. Uh, that's sort of the target that you have, Tara, for your, your place. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, 30 to 1 in Queen Yeah. yeah. Um, when it comes out of hickory, there's a lot more um, nitrogen and carbon. Um, so it just depends what we do have, what extra straw we do have. So sometimes it may not be where it should be, but um, yeah, we don't want to add extra costs and bring a lot more straw in or bark. Yeah. Yeah, I think that highlights the point too, that there's a science to compost. There's also an art to it. And it's often your materials are never the same each batch exactly. So there's a little bit of an art to getting that balance right. But over time, you usually get a feel for, for making it work. Um, and the microbes can be a little bit flexible and forgiving. Um, yeah, so the key other thing, I guess, that uh, you may have to consider if you're making compost on farm is don't, by, don't use contaminated feedstock, no glass, plastic, metals, TVs, condoms, chemicals, heavy metals, thongs, toothbrushes, bits of wire, microwave dials, you name it, you can get it, I've seen it, and you don't want to use it. So in the case, Tara, I guess you've got really safe feedstock in that you know the two sources of your materials, you've got two main sources but sometimes people get green waste from council, for example, and that can be problematic. Sometimes it's good, but you just gotta be mindful of it. And I guess the second thing is make sure it's as cheap as chips because that makes the compost cheap. Uh, have you done a pricing, Tara, on your the cost sort of per cubic meter of pig manure? Like how, do you, how much do you pay your brother for it or does he give it to you for family rates? Well, mate, right? no. Originally it was that he'd take the straw off our, from our cereal, which goes in and then we get it back out. Um, yeah. But our calculations, it's about $18 a tonne with the labour, um, water. That's to make the final product. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you're getting pretty cheap feedstock, which is the main thing to keep the price down. Yeah, which, yeah. which gains it. To start bringing the story in and not getting enough of um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Matt, I saw your chat there. Yeah, the ratio there is some ways to do it with a spreadsheet, Matt, on reading the ratio of carbon to nitrogen. Um, so we can share them with you, but it is a little bit eyeballing it. The way the analogy I use is pasta and sauce. Now, I know some people have a lot more sauce in their pasta than others, but if you just think pasta to source, the pasta being the carbon and the source being the nitrogen component. But it is a little bit of trial. So the first couple of times you make compost with materials, it's about sort of just working out exactly the dynamics between the two. But there are some spreadsheets. Um, Sky, Tara is not clear. Um, okay, so Tara, you're probably going to have to be a little bit, I'm not sure whether it's you or the connection at the other end, but I can hear you pretty clearly. So we'll just have to keep going, but we will record this everyone. So hopefully we can get a good recording for you. Um, the final thing on feedstock uh, is the ease of handling. So, you know, you might be getting access to cheap manure, but it might be really hard to handle. It might come in the truck and slop around and make you smell for about two weeks, no matter how many times you scrub yourself. So yeah, you just got to be mindful that some materials are a bit easier to handle and, and are on farm than others. And so the second thing, if you're going to make compost on farm, apart from your site and your uh, feedstock, the third thing, sorry, is equipment. So this is where you can spend lots of money or you can spend a little bit of money. So you've just got to make that right decision. 
Uh, and so there's all different types of equipment that you may or may not need, but you need equipment to handle and mix materials, which is often, if you're making aerated compost, it's a turner. Well, even minimum or fermented compost uh, turners can be handy. Um, you just need to use them less, uh, but also buckets and tractors or front end loaders or tanks for watering. Um, so you need the key bits of equipment to sort of control the decomposition and also to handle the, the raw materials and the final product. Uh, so Tara, you, I remember we were having a chat before yesterday and you sort of went on a bit of a trip to sort of explore all this stuff and you, you finally pinned down a turner that you bought, but it took a bit of decision making, like it's obviously a bit of an investment, would that be a fair call? Yeah, definitely. And, um, we, the one we've ended up with is, um, we sourced locally, so it was just um, yeah easy, and a second-hand one. So yeah, we um, that's why we've got it. But it, yeah, it does a great job, and we're happy with it. So we're yeah. lucky we were able to get one that was so close. Yeah, yeah. There are there are often second ones pop up if you keep your eyes open, and if they're in good nick, well, they you know they're obviously a good buy because you can you can go to town and all these things add up. But yeah, again, it's about keeping that cost down of the final product. Um, so uh, this is another this is the fermentation composting side on farm up in northern Victoria, and you can see here the guys have have invested a bit more in a, in a bit of a trommel and a hopper and things like that so they can screen their compost. But they, they, they are using green waste as part of their compost mix, so they do get some plastics and things that they want to get out. Um, so, yeah, you've got different equipment, but if you can keep it low cost and front end loaders or tractors with really good buckets on them are a really handy tool and they can do a lot of the job for you, including turning a compost if you just want to keep it really simple. You don't need to invest in a turner. Um, but a good tractor with a slow gear is always handy. Um, so let's get in now to just quickly go through making a batch of compost. And I appreciate today is just a sort of one hour webinar or thereabouts. So there will probably be some technical detail that we just have to skim over. But the first, pretty much the first step is to mix your materials and then make sure there's enough water. There's the right balance of water and it's about a 60% water that you aim for or moisture content that you aim for. Uh, and then obviously if you're for fermenting the compost, once you've mixed it and added your inoculum, then you uh, cover it over. So Tara, how, how do you go about mixing? Like you've got your manure and you've got your straw or your hay and you've got your turner sort of, sort of how, what's the sort of first steps that you do? Yeah, so the, I guess once it comes out of piggery, it's, um, it's laid in the windrow, so it's already laid out for us. Um, We've got a tent like JCB Kelly handler, which we might have to um, make the roll a bit thinner so the turner can go along okay without too much pressure. Um, and then, yeah, or if we need to add straw or if we're adding anything else, the sheet manure or something, we just use the bucket of the um, JCB. So it's basically yeah, the JCB is our main thing. With yep, the, yep. And you've got a water tank that you can go along and wet it up as you need to. Yeah, so we um, put a water tank behind the turner or yep. if it's too dry and we need to catch up, we've got basically like your picture there, a 5,000 litre tank on an old trailer that we um, pull behind. Yep, 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 great. Yep, so it's about, uh, I guess, in my experience, it's really set it up well. Take the time to do it right at the beginning and you'll, you'll, it'll pay dividends later on. You won't have to go back and sort out problems, especially with the fermenting method where you put a cover on it. You know, you don't have to pull the cover off as much, if, if at all. Um, so once you've got your windrow set up, and we've seen a few pickies of windrows, so I thought I'd give you a picky of something else. And then you, you turn, if you're aerating, you turn it. Even if you're doing a fermentation method, you may turn it once or twice initially in the first week or so. And you add water if you need to. And then obviously the key thing is to monitor the compost heap to see that it's on track, that the microbes are, are behaving themselves. And so the main way on farm to do that, the simple way is just to get a compost probe thermometer and to keep a check on the windrows with that. Um, I've just put some general uh, guidelines from the Australian standard there on what you've, you're aiming for. Um, Tara, how do you go about monitoring your compost? How do you know that the microbes are doing what they're supposed to be doing? Yeah, so we've got a um, temperature tester. Um, 
a probe which we stick into the compost and get down down into the middle of it. Um, so yeah, we do that in the process of the, the 12 week process. We'll at the start probably do it most days to see where it's at. Because it's at that point of 65 degrees that we'll turn it and water it. And yeah. So that, that with the aerated method, that's sort of the signal that yes, it's really heating up, it's going really quickly. We need to add a bit more air in there and just, you know, keep it in its within its comfortable range. Um, and so with the no turn or the fermentation method where you don't really turn it that much, or you might turn it a few times initially and then leave it, it's just helping you know that the, the compost microbes are doing their thing. I've got a question from Sky on the chat. Does the salt content or quality of water affect compost? Um, Sky, look, yeah, I guess you, the cleaner or the better quality of the water you use, the better in general. But um, I have seen compost made on really muddy, high sediment water and it does fine. Generally, as long as, you know, the water's not contaminated, if it's really, really saline, like seawater, you may have an issue, but uh, generally most other waters I'd suggest you are pretty safe for composting. Um, uh, measuring moisture, John's just asked a question about measuring moisture content. Yep, the main tool to use, John, is your fist. So you grab a pile of the ready mix. Once you've mixed your windrow, you grab a handful and you squeeze it and it's called the, the hand moisture squeeze test. Sounds original. And what happens is if the water just drips steadily from your hand when you squeeze the big handful. If it just drips steadily, you've got the right level. If it runs out as a stream off your hand when you squeeze it, it's too wet. And if you squeeze it really hard and nothing drips off your fingers, then it's too dry. So you just want it to just drip, drip, drip off when you squeeze a handful of ready mixed stuff. And you can do that again through, throughout the composting process. Uh, the, with the fermentation method, because you cover it, it doesn't evaporate, which has its pros and cons. The pro is you need much less water than the turned method, considerably less, maybe 70, 80% less over the cycle of the composting cycle. But the downside is that sometimes it can get a little bit too wet. So you just have to be mindful of that as well. Um, yes, but that's the simple way to do it, John. Sorry, it's a cheap method, but it works really well. But I can sell you something for about 800 bucks if you really want. Um, okay, and then uh, we've got the, we're monitoring the batch and then when it gets towards being finished. So Tara, how do you know that, that the compost is sort of starting to get to where it needs to get and has gone through the process? What tells you guys that? Um, basically that, yeah, when the temperature drops to, I don't know, about yeah, 10 degrees from the outside temperature. Or yeah. So around 40 degrees or thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah. And the colours changed and, and the materials obviously transformed. There's no more odours. Um, then sort of telling you, okay, she's gone through the cycle. Yeah, that's what, yeah, basically it looks like soil, doesn't it? Um, yep, yep. So, yes. So at that point, if you do want to get a test done, like Wes and me are looking at one there on a batch, so uh, if you're on farm, you might not want to do that. You might want to just do it once to see what's happening. And then after that, you're happy. But um, certainly a commercial composter will, should be testing the batches and we'll come to that in a minute. And then uh, if you do want to mature and store it for a bit longer, you can. Or if you're really keen just to get it out on the paddock, uh, you can do that as well. Um, okay, so we've kind of just gone through what um, Tara's system there hopefully um, reasonably clear again it is a little mini webinar today but um, there were you know there's opportunities to learn more about it for sure and there's plenty on on the internet but basically you mix mix and get the moisture content right uh, if you were doing the fermentation method you'd also inoculate at that stuck one and then step two you cover it if you're fermenting uh, step three you turn and add water as needed so in a in a aerated system that's you, you do that usually on temperature, a temperature signal when it starts to get certain height, 60, 65, you'll get out there and turn it. Uh, if it's a fermentation system, you may just turn it to make sure that the moisture content is sort of even through the pile in the first couple of weeks, a uh, couple of times, and then you'll leave it. And then you monitor it through the system, keep your eye on temperature. Uh, you can get some other ways of measuring CO2 or oxygen levels, but the simple and, and effective one is just temperature. 
And then if you want to test and then batch, uh, that's the next step. And then obviously mature and store, but usually it's like chocolate cake or chocolate cookies. Once they come out of the oven, they just go straight in the tummy. And it's the same with the nice compost. People just like to get it out in the paddock. Um, so you can add things to your compost heap. We call these compost additives. And they include things like microbes and clay. They're two common things that people mix in when they're making, when they first sort of set up their windrow. Tara, what do you guys add to your compost windrows? Um, well, firstly, we also add a bit of the old, like matured compost. Yep. Speed it up and get those the bugs that are in that um, yep. to help it along the way. We also, yeah, put a little bit of clay, um, maybe five cents. Um, and yeah, some microbes, like a microsol that we bring in. From yeah, yeah. So you use an inoculum of bugs as well as some clay and then a little bit of the previous compost, which has that microbial community of composting bugs that again, just helps sort of really ensure you've got a good inoculation through the compost. What sort of ratio of the previous compost you add in a windrow? Like how much would you put in, say those yeah. long windrows you've got there? Yeah. Pretty rough, but I don't know. One percent, we JCB and a lot. Yeah. So it's not much. It's just a little bit, just like um, icing on the cake sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Get those bugs that are already in there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And some of the uh, fermentation sites, we know that uh, after a year or two, those microbes, the fermenting microbes, are literally all over the whole site. And a couple of the really long-term sites, they don't even bother inoculating their compost. They just put a bit of, bit of the previous compost in and they know that they've got really good counts of the fermenting microbes. So they don't need to add in, uh, you know, a liquid inoculum. Uh, but there's other things you can customise your compost with. Gypsum, lime, dolomite uh, and rock phosphate. So that first compost I showed you at the beginning of the webinar uh, with the straw and sheep manure, uh, we put about 20% rock phosphate into that windrow um, at a startup. So there's different, different things you can add. I guess one of the things to be mindful of with the minerals like gypsum, lime, dolomite or rock phosphates, et cetera, is if you put them in at too high a rate, your compost heat might get too dense. So the bulk density goes right up because they're quite heavy. They're like sand really. And that, that can have consequences for aeration and flow of air through the pile, which is particularly important. Well, it's even important in the fermentation method too, but you don't want them to be too dense. And so you just got to be wary. But gypsum, research has shown that gypsum at about 5% can, can actually help the humus formation in, in compost. And there's been some work done in the US by the Rodale Institute. And we've seen it here on a couple of trial batches as well, where gypsum really helped improve the humus content of our uh, compost. So you can add things to your compost. Um, whether you need to add microbes or not, I guess, the, in my opinion, the best thing is to do is just to trial them. Um, there's certainly no harm, but, but you will get successful composting without adding microbes generally for the aerated method. But certainly if you can do the fermentation method, it's a good idea to either buy an inoculum or make it yourself, which is usually a bit cheaper. So the finished product, as we've just gone through the process, the finished product should really be dark brown to black in colour. It should be homogenous, so kind of like really uh, even looking and um, or, uh, most of the original material should have transformed and be broken down in size. So in Australia, there's actually an Australian standard. So just like there's an Australian standard for seat belts and all kinds of things, there's an Australian standard for compost and that regulates compost manufacturing and quality if you're gonna sell it as a commercial product. So obviously if you're making it on farm and just using it yourself, then that Australian standard doesn't really apply. You don't have to worry about it so much, but it's a good idea to try and meet it because it means your compost has a reasonable level of quality. Um, but if, if you're buying compost to use on farm, if you don't want to make it, but you do want to buy it, then it's a really good idea to make sure that the person you're buying from is meeting that standard in the manufacturing. And so if you are buying it off farm, then the commercial suppliers need to regularly test their batches. And that Australian standard at a minimum sort of tells you that it doesn't contain physical and chemical contaminants. It won't kill plants and 
and that might sound strange, but if you've got an immature compost with lots of volatile um, biochemistry going on, it can actually be phytotoxic or kill plants and that the compost is mature and stable. So um, as well as meeting the Australian standard, a high quality compost, this is again the fermentation compost over near North Central Victoria. It has a level of nutrients in it. So you're getting a spectrum of nutrients and also it should have a high level of what we call humus. So humus is really stable, transformed organic matter that has a, has a, a lot of really powerful agronomic effects. You don't need a lot of humus to have to change your water holding capacity significantly and your nutrient stability, your nutrient efficiency. It's, it has pretty profound effects on both of those things in the soil. And yes, Ross, I was just about to get to that one. So Ross has just put in there, David Johnson says that high fungal level is important. Uh, yes, I can a little bit, Ross, uh, but so I've just put there at the bottom of that slide that it's worth also aiming for a good fungi to bacteria ratio. As I understand it, Ross, and we've only just started to make a Johnson Sioux uh, compost, so I can't comment on, on that personally yet. But the more you mature a compost after it's made, then the more that you'll get fungi recolonizing the compost because they don't live in the high temperatures. So they will recolonize the compost when it cools down towards the end. And so if you allow compost to mature, then that will improve the fungi to bacteria ratio. And Ross, I, yeah, I, I know David, Dr. David Johnson really promotes that high fungi to bacteria ratio. I'm pretty sure that there's, that other soil, other composts can achieve that. And I know for a fact they can. Um, I don't think that's the only way that you can get a high fungal ratio, but certainly aging a well-made compost will increase the fungal ratio. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a feel for it, but it's another test to do and definitely worth considering. Um, and John has just asked, sorry, I missed the temperatures that indicate that the cycle was over. Yeah, so John, when it, as Tara sort of mentioned, when it drops to around 40 degrees, then you know, and, and it's, and it's transformed because if it drops to 40 degrees and it's still semi-raw then you know it hasn't successfully composted but if it's transformed and gone through a high temperature phase for you know five six weeks uh, then yes about 40 degrees will tell you that it's on the the maturing side of the cycle if that makes sense uh, and that will be it uh, that's all right and just put up a hand just sorry I, I haven't been able to work out how to get the up hand so if you can just punch something into chat that's going to be a bit easier for us i think uh tara is there anything else you look for in compost quality or, or i know you showed me a test so the, how do you sort of judge the quality of your end product um i guess also with weed seeds and stuff we just need to make sure that it does hit those high temperatures to kill the weeds um yeah. and along <coughs> the sides of the windrows just make sure that not bringing in old, like non manure, non mature compost when it's about mature. Um, it's probably a big thing. And halfway between, like about three weeks down into the compost, we put two rows into one. Yeah. Um, we move both of those rows into the middle so that we're picking up any of the um, compost on the bottom that may not have got hit that temperature to try and get those yeah. or any of those weed seeds. So that's probably yeah. our main, main thing. Yeah. Great. Yeah. No. And that's that. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. So that's to make sure you have high temperatures evenly through the whole windrow. That's the really power of having a turner because it does help you put the outside in and the inside out. So you get that high temperature right through all the material through the composting process. Um, and the fermentation method's the same. So you could turn it, say, twice over that cycle just to make sure that for that same reason, to make sure that there's no areas that miss that temperature spike. Joe's put in there as a risk of disease from carcasses. Joe, there is, but if you, when you compost properly, then the biosecurity risk of the end product is, is minimal to nothing. And that's what the Australian standard test, one of the Australian standard tests is for uh, pathogens. So E. coli and salmonella. And um, so, yeah, if you do a good job and feedlots often, well, they always uh, compost carcasses mostly. And so they have to make sure they do a good job. But yes, there is a risk from carcasses and from food scraps. But if you do a, 
professional job on farm, you'll find that that risk is, is disappeared. Uh, and in fact, you know, compost and vermicast have been shown to be sort of um, beneficial against diseases and disease risks. Okay, I'll keep rolling on, just mindful of time. Um, so some important things to remember when buying compost from a supplier, watch out for contaminated products. I've seen all of those things on, that I've written there in, uh, in compost. And uh, there are some cowboys in the game. I'll probably get myself into trouble, but I won't mention any names. But there are, there are some really professional commercial compost operators. And unfortunately, there's some people that do cut corners. So you just really be, might be, need to be mindful because not all composts have the same quality. And unfortunately, one of the real problems in the Australian composting sector is that a lot of the material from the cities, green waste and food scraps and biosolids, there's a real need to get it out and get it out of the cities. And so this whole compost sort of bandwagon is really lift growing. Uh, and a lot of the motivation for a lot of those systems is to lift and shift. Get it to temperature for a couple of days, get it over 55 degrees to pasteurize it and then shift it. And that's not final compost, that's just a pasteurized product. It may have potentially killed disease risk, but it's not a fully mature humified compost. So the first thing, as Tara mentioned, is no weed seed. You don't want weed seed. I used to do agronomy on vegetables in southern Queensland, and the bane bain of our life was one year the compost would be free of weed seed, the next year it would be full of it, just because they changed the site manager that we didn't know about. Um, and so the other key thing to remember is to check the compost meets your Australian standard if you're buying it. Ask for verification of that. It should be mature at ambient temperature or, you know, around that 40 degrees and smell stable. This pile here, which was from a trial site near Narromine in central New South Wales two years ago where we're doing some trials on cropping, it, when we dumped that, we had the field day about 80 metres away from that pile and you could smell the compost smell the odor at 80 meters and it was still at 60 degrees. So that's not officially not compost, that's still composting. So to sell that as a final product as compost is actually uh, misleading is a nice way to put it. But unfortunately that's often the problem these days is people are desperate to get it off their site because it takes up room and there's more material coming in. So that if you want to get an analysis, um, and I know Tara gets a test done occasionally, you can ask the supplier to provide you with a compost analysis um, and professional manufacturers will be willing to do that. If someone says to you, oh yeah, no, she's all good. I know it meets the standard and they won't give you a test. My recommendation to you is treat that supply with a great deal of caution. Uh, you, are, you are spending a lot of money on your second most important asset on the farm. You do not want, want to be putting on dodgy stuff. Um, if you're making on compost on farm, it's a good idea to periodically test the batch just to make sure that it is of good quality. So Tara, how do you go? What's your testing regime as far as sending it off to the lab? Um, I guess probably once a year, once when we've got some mature products, we'll... Yeah. Bag it up and yeah, send it yep, away. shoot it off. And you have a pretty consistent feed stock, so it's the same stuff pretty much every time. So you kind of know where it comes from by now. Does that sort of make sense? Yeah, definitely. And it's, they're pretty well. It's pretty similar each time. But yeah. We just want to make sure that we don't have any bad bacteria in there, and um, we've killed all the weed seeds, I guess. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, and I think the message is that I've, I've learned over the years is if, you've, if you're getting your feed stock from the same source each time and that doesn't change radically, then once you've done a test or two, you kind of know what you're going to get. Whereas if you get new materials in from, you know, a different shed, for example, where they might manage differently, then it might be worth just checking at that point. Um, yeah, Ross has just put a question there, compost microbial tests, fairly expensive. Yeah, so Ross, there's, there, well, there's a couple of labs in Australia that obviously do soil microbial tests and that they will also do a compost analysis for you. The two, the, there's a couple. The one that mainly does a lot of this stuff at the moment is microbiological laboratories in South Australia. So they have a compost uh, test or assay as part of their packages. 
So I have had that done and they will also do a disease suppression estimate. So they estimate for you how, 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 how much disease suppressive potential the compost has. Um, so microbiological laboratories, but there's another lab that sh that's just been launched, which does DNA analysis. And that, that will also be a really useful one because that's the sort of next generation of testing microbes. So it's pretty exciting. It's called Metagen. M-E-T-A-G-E-N. So those are the two labs that I've, I've seen tests from and I've used, I've used microbiological laboratories quite over the years. Um, the Metagen is a new lab, so I've only just seen my first test from it, but I know that they're, they're jumping in as well. So they're probably the two best bets for you. There are certainly a few other labs, but some of the other labs actually outsource the microbe testing to these labs, and then they just put them on their bit of paper. So um, they're the two main labs that I'm aware of. There could be some more. Um, so now get on to using compost. Uh, and there's Tara and her uh, doing multitasking. So Tara, do you want to just uh, let us know how you use the compost? Because obviously you go to a lot of effort to make this stuff. So how are you putting it out? What sort of rates sort of give us a bit of a feel for it? Yep. So um, we're putting it out on our cropping land at the moment. Um, and then once we've... I guess got them, the soil's going well, and then we'll go to the pastures. But um, at the moment, we use that from the picture at the start the um, compost spreader. Um, we're putting about four to five tonne out per hectare. We originally put through one tonne and spread it over, obviously, got over a lot more area, but um, now we're concentrating it on smaller areas and putting it out at higher tonnages to try and get. I guess a quicker impact, um, so therefore we're able to reduce our um, nitrogen and phosphorus inputs and yeah, also all yep. the other benefits we get from it. Yeah, so you're putting it on at a soil amendment rate rather than a top dressing rate and concentrating in areas, yep. And you've got a spreader that you bought to do the job? Yep, so the, yep. Um, that brochure that yeah, we picture at the start, um, it yep. holds I think it's 25 cubic metres or something. Um, yep, yep, great. Um, so how, how much of the property do you cover each year? Uh, so we'll get a few hundred hectares probably. Okay, yeah, no, that's a fair, fair whack, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple of questions there so from Ruth. Yeah, sorry, Ruth, I did forget that lab. I do apologise. So the Soil Food Web Institute lab. Um, also will do microbial analysis and compost analysis too. So thanks, Ruth. Yeah, so that's the third the third main one in the game. Yeah, uh, appreciate that. So the Soil Food Web Institute. Um, and Tim's asked about expected decrease in volume from fresh product to mature compost. So as your fresh windrow starts to decompose, some of the carbon in the material gets breathed off by all the microbes back in the air through respiration, and that's why compost heaps shrink. Uh, Tara, how, how much volume reduction do you reckon your windrows do over the sort of whole cycle of composting? Probably half. So yep. we have the two windrows, and then we can put them into one and treat it the same. So it's probably yep. half. Yeah. Yeah, so, and uh, Tim, I think for the, so it's, it can be around 30 to 50%, Tim. So with the fermentation method, when you have it covered, you lose less to respiration, but you still do lose some. But yeah, if you, it, um, it's anywhere from that 20% to 50% usually. De depends a little bit on the respiration and a few other factors as well, but you will lose volume, that's for sure. Um, so I guess to sort of summarise up uh, um, the sort of, compost, using compost, uh, the first thing is be really clear why you need to use it. Like if you just need to use it because it's tax time, then it's probably not the right reason to use compost. So you need to use it for an agronomic reason, whether it's for soil structure, for water holding, to improve soil biology, <clears throat> whatever your agronomic goals are. So you need to identify them and get out and, and you know do that proper soil management and identify your soil constraints. Often in crop paddocks, there's usually structural issues and water holding issues, and in, in same in intensive uh, cropping paddocks. Uh, and then once you've decided what your goals are, then the right type of compost. So there are different grades. So if you're making on farm, you're pretty much gonna get one grade. 
especially if you're using soft materials like straw and manure. <laughs> but if you're using wood chips or um, green waste with uh, twigs and stems in it, then you may get a, a coarser grade. But you just need to be clear which grade you're going to use. Uh, and you can see the guys here in Forbes just looking at different grades of compost. Um, and, but I will say sometimes any quality compost will help. So you don't really matter what grade it is. I just need compost because my soil needs a bit of help. But I have put a little dog poo warning there. Don't accept a compost that you are offered at free or near free rates because it's usually too good to be true. So the reason that I've got the little dog poo going is that people are sometimes, or farmers are sometimes offered really, you know, to either free or we'll pay for the freight and get it to you. And it's like five bucks, 10 bucks a landed. You have to be really wary and always get that stuff really carefully tested because often it may not be a high quality agricultural grade compost. And in New South Wales, for a number of years, <clears throat> the guys were sold in inverted commas, very low cost. Um, this product that was not, it was out of red wheelie bins. So if everyone knows what goes in the red wheelie bins, then they'll know what came out in this compost. And <clears throat> the EPA New South Wales actually banned that stuff two years ago because it was way too toxic, had too much contaminants in it. But for a number of years, it was freely or almost freely available across the central west cropping zone. And there were a number of farmers that took up that opportunity. It is not an opportunity. So you know what it feels like when you're on the lawn and you're not sure where the dog poo is and you're really, really, really cautious where to step. That's how cautious you should be when you get offered that stuff. So I'm not saying don't use it, but just be really cautious. And then as Tara sort of highlighted, there's two main ways you can use compost. You can apply it as a sort of light annual top dressing, um, or you can use it as a soil ameliorant, soil amendment, whatever term you like to use at a higher rate. So here it is going out. I think that's going out at five tonnes the hectare on a trial, uh, again, in Narromine Dubbo in New South Wales. And so using compost, when you're applying it, the right time, right equipment and the right rate, so Tara, what's your timing of application? We didn't talk about that. So when do you put it out? Um, so the manure is coming all year round, so we can make it all year round. So we aim to get the first batch, I guess, just before sowing. So March, April. So then it can um, get yeah, ready for the season. Um, over the winter, we a lot of our paddocks we can't get on because they get quite wet. So. Yep again in the spring um, yep. or yeah we've also got loosened so we can some probably get them out on those a bit earlier but yeah April or March April and then later in the year yep and it doesn't burn so it's a stable product so it won't burn crops like you know high high analysis fertilizer might so so you can safely put it out close or on planting or even as a side dress or you know top dress but yeah, generally people try to get it out a month or two before before they um, go into plant. What about incorporation? What's your theory on incorporation? Um, no, this is just, yeah, our sowing is the incorporation, I guess. Yeah, so this is no till, so it's just going on the surface. Yeah. Yeah, and so you will, some people will say, you know, you really do need to turn it in and, and some people do turn it in with great success. But if you're in a no-till system, then yeah, obviously you're not going to turn it in. And it will still work, especially when you have good soil structure. As your soil structure improves, you have more pores in the soil. So that compost will move down through into the soil profile. So um, as your soil improves, it's the same with lime. Yes, yeah, you can turn, incorporate lime in the soil and get a very quick result. But if you have good soil structure, then surface application will also work. Um, yeah, so the other thing to be mindful of is you can blend lime, gypsum or other minerals prior to spreading. You don't have to just put them in the compost up front. You can also put them in just with your mature compost, blend them with a bucket so that you get two birds with one stone. And compost will often magnify the effect of lime and dolomite or gypsum. So by that, I mean that if traditionally you used a tonne to two tonnes to the hectare or whatever it is, to get a, line, a pH adjustment to your target. With compost, you, you can often find that you only need a third of that. Sometimes people see a quarter of the line will give them the same pH adjustment. So it seems to magnify the effect of 
uh, lining uh, and or gypsum. And that's, I think, my, my opinion on it is that's the colloid or the humus in it, which acts as a buffer. So uh, there's, there's that option too when you're applying compost. And sometimes people get pre-mixed all kinds of things like potash or rock phosphate or whatever. So the sky's the limit. Um, and so I guess the key thing though is that um, it needs to be part of a holistic approach to soil health and regenerative agronomy. This is a banana grower in North Queensland in four metres of rain and they make and use compost for about seven years. Um, and, he's, and Derek's his name. Derek's looking at the root systems of the bananas down there. He's not looking for the watch that he dropped. And so, you know, he's using compost as part of a whole, whole nutrient system to minimise his nutrients. And he's next to the barrier reef. So, you know, he's trying to do the right thing by the reef as well. But he's a large banana grower and they use a lot of fertiliser. So he's really trying to get efficiency in his fertilisers and build healthy banana root systems. Um, and so I guess just a few indicative rates. I think Tara, you said you put on about four to five tonnes per hectare. Um, yeah. And so I've just put, you know, some people top dress at half a tonne. Some people will go in at 10 tonne. Pastures, you'll see rates usually from around five to 15 tonnes. And in horticulture, well, I've used it in agronomy programs um, up to 100 tonnes um, and seen it used higher than that. Um, per hectare so it will pretty quickly kickstart a soil at that high rate but of course that's a horticulture where the cost inputs so they spend more money per hectare um, and this is um, where Spencer who's over in North Central Vic he's making the fermentation compost and he's got some compost trials going at the moment that we're going to have a look at later in the year uh, have a day there so it all depends on your soil constraint the cost of the product to you your enterprise goals you know how much you want to invest in the in different areas of the property each year to, to determine the rate. But yeah, have a, have a go and trial it and see, see how it's uh, helping or not helping. Uh, so in summary, I guess, just to sum things up before we wrap it up and maybe have a few chat, if there's any chat questions that we can cover. Uh, compost is not a magic bullet. Sorry to say that, but it isn't a magic bullet, but it is a scientific thing. So if you think it's unscientific, well, that went out the window in the mid 20th century. It's well known that it's a very scientific input and it's a very good input when used in the right place at the right time. It's not very hard to make or use. There's certainly a little bit of organizing to do, but once you get a feel for it, it's a bit like cooking, do it a few times, get a bit of a feel for the art of making it. Um, it's not too hard to do. You can make a small batch with just a tractor and a bucket and a water tank. And it's a good option if you can get it at a price. So obviously, Tara, you've been lucky because you've got the, the piggery next door and you can get the hay in the store. But some people do struggle to get materials to make compost. Um, but yeah, if you have to truck materials for, for hundreds of Ks, then the price really stacks up. But if you can, or you have a good commercial supplier that will give you it at a reasonable price and you do a cost benefit and a trial and it looks like it's showing promise, well, it's definitely a tool in the toolbox in your journey to a more holistic agronomy kind of approach on your place. And here you can see, you know, the three stages of what you're aiming for as your compost goes from that to that, you know, goes through a transition as it decomposes. So I might just sort of formally finish up on that. Tara, do you have any sort of thoughts or um, any things that I've missed or any observations you want to throw in at this point? No, I think, like you said, it's um, one of the tools in the toolboxes. Um, yeah, it's not going to um, turn your um, soils around just by itself, I guess, with or with the rates that we're using. But yep. definitely with that um, and other things that you choose to do, like it's enabled us to reduce our urea and, it's, um, yeah, our phosphorus has definitely improved. Um, yeah, we've got a lot more worms than we used to have, which is exciting. So, mm. yeah, just with um, other little things we're doing, I think, yeah, slowly we're improving our structure and our, yeah. Yep. Um, yep, great. Yeah, just taking that whole of system approach to try and lift the, lift the whole game. Yep. Yeah, I guess yep. on a personal thing, like when starting up with the compost, it kind of <laughs> opened my eyes to soil health and um, plant health and people health, I guess. So that kind of started us on the yep. planning or the region, whatever you want to name it. But yes, yeah, yep. that's 
sometimes it, it, that. it used to be called biological farming when I was doing agronomy in the mid 2000s that's what we called ourselves biological agronomists but I think that word's disappeared now <laughs> they use the word regenerative yeah, so exactly. yeah but that's yeah that was the word wasn't it and, and in the US too that was the, the main term biological farming but it seems to have disappeared um, yeah, no, great. Thanks for that, Tara. And thanks, like, for, thanks for being involved. This is the first time everyone that me and Tara have worked together. So hopefully I didn't um, carry on too much, Tara. But yeah, it's, um, and webinars are a bit of a different medium for me too, just sort of sitting around so we can just have a chat in the group. Um, we've got a couple of little chats in the chat box. We'll see if we can tackle them. Um, I'll just go up. Uh, yeah, John, thanks for that feedback. Um, Ross has put in there, how much action of biology is the benefit of compost versus addition on organic matter? Yeah, I'm not 100% clear on your question, Ross. Are you saying, are you asking the difference between sort of building organic matter in the paddock with say cover crops and root volume, perennial root grasses and sort of getting humus that way versus the benefit of adding compost for organic as as a kind of source of organic matter so i'm not sure if i'm going to answer you correctly but my experience and my understanding from looking at you know reading the different papers and trials on compost over the years that compost at sort of 5 10 15 tons per hectare doesn't really lift organic matter levels in the soil very much it certainly has it does lift a little bit obviously but it has this the colloid or the humus in it and the other benefits are probably more of what it does. But um, whereas to get that long-term humus in your soil, I think root volume from perennial pastures and from you know multi-species cover crops and root volume that way is probably a bigger lever to pull, if that makes sense, and minimising tillage and, and all the other things. But yeah, I'm not sure if I understood your question 100%. So I hope I kind of got there. Um, Marinda's also asking about making certified organic compost. So Marinda, I think it's Marinda. Marinda, the, for, to, if you're certified organic, then the standard, the Australian standard, the National Standard for Organics, requires that you use a compost that meets the Australian standard for composting. So if you're certified organic, as long as your supply of your compost verifies that it meets the Australian standard for compost that we've been talking about at a minimum, then you can use it on a certified organic block. If you're certified with NASA, they have additional clauses in their standards. So they have extra criteria, but at a minimum, it needs to meet that. So there's no such thing as certified organic compost. I know people say there is. It's, it's called a registered input to an organic farm. So if you look at someone selling compost with, with the organic logo on it, the compost itself is just a registered input. Um, to the farm but yes as long as it meets the Australian standard by default it's allowed in organics but NASA do have extra clauses. Uh, Sharon's asked can you use contaminated uh, silage bales as yes Sharon if they're contaminated it means they're just spoiled with um, yeast and the bacteria have gone south on it and as long as it hasn't got contamination from chemicals or metal or wire or bits of plastic and all that, if you just mean that it's just spoiled from the microbial point of view, then that, that will be no worries in a compost. Gordon, you can, you can spread it or put it in. I think if you're incorporating it, okay, and you're taking your structure backwards. So it's, if your structure is an issue and you're trying to minimize disturbance, then spreading it on top is always better. But if you do have to go in, if a paddock is really, really poor, in my opinion, if the paddock's really, really tight and you're not getting growth and you just want to get a bit of aeration to try and start it on a structural, improving structure sort of journey, then there may be a place for shallow incorporation of it. But as a general rule, I think you're kind of going one step backwards as soon as you get that tillage going. But in, in a very problematic, tight, sealed paddock, incorporating it might be a more effective way. But on, so on the surface, we'll also give you good results. Um, uh, yeah, so Kim's asked us too about stimulating biology tips for compost going down the tube. So Tara, have you mucked around with trying to get compost out uh, down the tube with the planner at the planning? No, um, not at the seeding time. Um, my brother's done a bit of the um, subsoil manuring, so putting 
20 or 10 tonne down, um, like big deep scissors. Um, but no, not, no, nothing with the cedar. Yeah. Yeah. So you've done some subsoil amendments to see if it gives you bang for yeah. buck in the subsoil as well. Yeah. Have you seen any results from that? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, um, we kind of come up with probably 10 tonnes the rate rather than 20 tonnes, you don't get that extra. Yeah. Um, so we've got this great photo of a crop that's washed out and then just that sort of square where we did the trial, mm. green and, um, yeah, grew through, which I guess maybe a bit of the ripping helped that as yep. well. Yeah, just just to trigger that change in that first couple of years. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, Kim. The other way that people do use compost because unless you get a compost prill, which I showed you a picture of earlier in the webinar, uh, which is expensive because obviously prilling compost costs a lot of money um, per ton. Um, the other way people can do it, you can do it, is of course make a compost extract or a compost tea. We didn't really have time to go in them today, but yes, you can. You can wash your compost through water or wash water through your compost and you extract the dissolved solids in it, or the suspended solids, and that becomes what you call a compost extract or compost leachate is the term. And I think that's a, a pretty good product to put down the boot just to stimulate the rhizosphere of the young seedling of your, of your cereal or whatever you're growing. Um, so that's one way. Or you can brew up or culture up a compost tea over 24, 48 hours with a aerator, etc., and apply that in the same way down the boot. So there's two kind of, three kind of ways. You could get a prill, um, or if you can get somehow work out how to get sort of loose compost mix down the boot as well, but it might be a bit tricky from a machinery point of view. But certainly a prill or those two liquid forms are the way that people are trying it. Um, okay, so yeah, we're, we're just over an hour, but if there's any last questions, there's one. Wes is saying, awesome, Tara, keep up the good work. Yeah, good on you, Wes. So Wes was was in the picture there before, um, and that's his operation where we saw a few of those, that no turn or that fermentation minimum turn operation. Um, yeah, any other comments or questions before we wrap it up? Um, if you have any follow-up, yeah, just let Penny know and the Vic No Till guys know and we can see how we can help you. Um, yeah, we will be doing a few more compost events in, in Victoria over the next couple of months. So we'll keep you in the loop on them um, on through the through the network. But otherwise, um, yeah, we might wrap it up and say thanks everyone for attending. Sorry we're a few minutes late. <laughs> we were all wondering where you were and, and obviously we were sitting there not pressing the right button. So thanks for coming along. We hope you got something from it. And Tara, thanks for sharing your insights as well. Uh, thank you very much. And yeah, good luck, everyone. It's, yeah, it's exciting. I enjoy making the compost and um, seeing the results you can get. So yeah, have fun and good luck. Thanks, everyone.